All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's been a long afternoon and evening for you. So I'll try to wrap up with changing gears a little bit and also kind of putting certain things in question of what we do. And we go on a important topic at the same time it's the most uh, frequent situation we deal in neurooncology it is actually the one we have the least solid data and the most disagreement and the highest variety so i have no uh, no conflict of interest with this presentation so what are we talking about we're going on brain metastases which occurred 10 to 30% of cancer, and actually you'll find it up to 50% of all cancer patients may get it. Most frequently lung cancer, but also breast cancer, melanoma can come years later, uh, and almost any other cancer can uh, show up with metastatic disease. So uh, first, you know, we say, oh, but we were talking about diseases, primary CNS lymphoma, we were talking about the uh, medulloblastoma about GBM, but brain metastasis is actually not uh, a disease. That's a manifestation of the disease. It's really the spread of the disease from one part of the body to the other. If somebody has uh, liver or bone metastasis, we're not going to call it liver or bone cancer. Um, and really, it's important that we know where it comes from. And I think that's often forgotten uh, when we only look what's happening above the clavicle, when we also need to look at the whole cancer control. So treatment is really dictated about the uh, stage, how much local disease we have, uh, distant disease. Do we have brain disease as the sole site of metastatic disease that if you would do surgery followed by radiation, that you could actually almost say, okay, I'll exclude the brain somewhat but they have an oligometastatic disease and the metastatic disease is uh, controlled. At the same time, it is a disease in a situation the tumor had to get into the brain. So it is disseminated disease. So just because we see one or two uh, brain metastases, that doesn't mean that not all of the field is contaminated. contaminated. So we have to assume it's systemic disease. So we really need to look outside uh, brain metastasis alone. And of course, treatment needs to respond to the risk of recurrence, the aggressivity of the disease, and so on. And we are very good with statistics. We can say in median we get that, but we're actually very poor when it comes to individual prediction. I just want to show that with this kind of paper we did many years ago. Uh, on a large database, looking at uh, different experts based on the database, based on all the important parameters, uh, predicting who does well, uh, what. And you can see um, uh, at some point we're a little bit too optimistic, but at some point we're also too pessimistic. And we have a number of patients who do well. And that's the ones we really need to identify. That's the ones we want to do more. Um, this is a very select uh, data set it was. It was all patients who had uh, SRS for treatment. So uh, that's why it looks uh, better than you would expect from an everyday um, population. But still, it shows you need to identify the patients who benefit where you want to do more. And you also need to identify the patients where you actually should hold your horses. Because honestly, if you have survival that is best measured in weeks um, with survival of less than three week, uh, three months or so, I'm not sure any anti-tumor treatment will really improve the patient's quality of life. So there's a lot of myth in the management of brain metastasis. One is, oh, it's in the brain and all is touch that are equal. And uh, you have many trials done for brain metastases. And when you go, and I'll show that, you show that later on another slide, and look whether they even had or reported on the histologies. It's not reported. It's all a mixed bag. So no wonder if you uh, treat everybody the same, one fits it all, that you get outcomes you can't make sense of. The number of brain metastases, 1, 3, 5, 10, 15, uh, to predict 
um, can be questioned. I think the bio biology plays a role. Uh, the kinetics, how quickly these metastases grow. Whole brain radiation, which is the quote of what's the standard of treatment, is harmful. I'm the first one usually saying you have to think about late toxicity. Eventually it is, but I think something we need to look a little bit more differentiated. Um, obvious symptoms, no screening needed. Um, screening may be needed in order to have stage migration. And actually, you know, before you treat a lung cancer or a melanoma or a breast cancer, that you really don't have metastatic disease in the brain because it can be silent for quite a while. Uh, that's for the nihilistic. Yes, nothing works. And I've just shown you, yes, indeed, if you have patients dying within three months, uh, we have to actually focus more on quality of life and palliative care. Drug therapy is not effective, so that's why you need radiation. And I'll challenge a few of these uh, statements. So let's look at some of those statements. So all histologies are equal and brain meds as a diagnosis. And here some colleagues from uh, Greece have looked at the 100 most uh, cited papers about brain metastases. A lot of citations doesn't mean that they're all that good. And when I then looked through just the first 50, you know, actually I found that only 15% of those reports were actually specific on lung cancer or breast cancer and would otherwise uh, not specify that. And more importantly, um, randomized trials. So large cooperative group trials with the smartest people um, in 11 randomized trials, it was for all comers. Again, mixed all histologies, not specific. So then about what about whole brain radiotherapy? And the myth is that intracranial control is so important for quality of life. Um, let me show that on another paper. Uh, from the same group who is interested in stereotactic radiation therapy. And then they looked on the survival of patients with controlled and uncontrolled uh, brain metastases. And there was no difference in overall survival. Of course, quality of life was not looked at. But here I paraphrase my friend, Michael Brada from the UK, who said, you know, when you're dead, you're so much better off when you're dead with controlled brain metastases than with uncontrolled brain metastases. So I think, again, something to put in perspective, you need to look at the whole patient, not just at the brain. And if you do trials, you need to look at the right endpoints. What are we doing nowadays when we don't do whole brain radiation. We will resect or we will do stereotactic radio surgery. And by doing so, we can see that indeed we have a better local control. However, when we look at distant recurrence, no surprise, no difference, and actually no difference in survival. So it is really a question how much effort you want to do on the brain and what I want to try to get you think each time before you go with the routine surgery, radiation, or stereotactic radiation, how much delay do you induce? And is this patient symptomatic enough? Is the uh, lesion important enough? Um, or can you treat the whole cancer first systemically and then always add at the later stage uh, the local treatment? So Sonj Peters and colleagues looked through the literature and looked what they could find on quality of life and research utilization in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. So that's now metastatic non-small cell lung cancer with brain metastases. And when you look, you know, with whole brain radiation, yes, some reports said uh, improved KPS, improved quality of life, but other more sophisticated uh, quality of life analysis said, actually, it's worse with radiation. There is a deterioration in quality of life. And there's even 
more and higher symptom burden. Um, while with non-whole brain radiation therapy, actually stable to improvement. There has been a report also with some worsening. All I want to say, there's not one is right and one is wrong, but you know we interpret the data the way we want, but it's far from clear that brain metastasis in brain disease by itself is always that detrimental. Another thing which is more an observation and I can prove, we often overtreat and overmedicate patients with brain metastases. A lot of them have four times four dexamethasone, which is probably too high a dose for too long of a time. On top, dexamethasone has a long half-life, so you could actually uh, give it for a much shorter period of time, find other ways. When the tumor is out, actually, you may not, you have no more edema, you have no more mass effect, you can actually taper it off very quickly. Often gets forgotten, patients suffer more from myopathy, from steroid side effects. Anti-seizure medicine is only indicated when you had a seizure. It's a prophylactic uh, prescription of anti-seizure medicine may again not be needed. We have colleagues, and especially in the U.S., uh, Vinay Gandhi and uh, Paul Brown, looking at how to prevent cognitive decline with whole brain radiotherapy. And they have done randomized trial looking at adding memantine or, more recently, hippocampal avoidance radiotherapy. And they look at an endpoint very early on at uh, six months, and indeed, whole brain radiation therapy is detrimental. And if you uh, give whole brain radiation therapy without hippocampal, uh, right, without treating the hippocampus, it may be cognition a little better. But what I want to make the point, that's all true. But from 261 patients at the beginning enrolled, we have 25 um, that are still uh, around at that time. So again, we really have to wonder whether this is reasonable and we do the right thing and it's the right effort. Well, the median survival is only six to seven months. So again, what I said at the very beginning, we need to try to identify the high-risk patients. We need to identify the ones who can benefit from less is more or more careful radiation because they have a good outcome but here in six months survival, I think the memory loss doesn't play that much of a role anymore. So why are we treating uh, brain metastases different from disease in other organs? I think it has to do with the following uh, ideas and observations. So the soil is different in the brain. We have a blood-brain barrier that does not allow for many of our drugs to penetrate to the same extent and sufficiently into the brain. We get the brain metastasis. Actually, it's a, and you almost should say it's good that we have a blood brain barrier because otherwise we would have way more. 80% uh, you know, uh, you have a large, maybe 30, 35% of our blood flow that actually goes to the brain, of which is 80% uh, in the uh, cerebrum and 15% uh, cerebellar and 5% in the brainstem. And that's also why you see that kind of distribution when we have it. But with so much blood going into the brain, um, it's no wonder that brain metastases actually are frequent and they would be probably more frequent if he wouldn't have a blood-brain barrier. How do the brain metastases occur? The tumor cells are shedding, and they are traveling along the capillary bed and maybe stuck in the capillary bed. They extravasate actively across the blood-brain barrier, or where the blood-brain barrier is, for whatever reason, uh, not fully uh, intact. Um, there may be and is an immune-privileged 
environment in the brain that allows to invade and expand more easily. And it will recruit additional blood-brain barrier uh, vessels without a blood-brain barrier to actually uh, feed the metastatic disease. The blood-brain barrier itself are tight junctions, and those can be disrupted. They are disrupted by tumors that grow uh, fast, but we have also mechanical, chemical ways to uh, disrupt it. But we also have an active transport mechanism of efflux pumps or influx pumps that allows for drugs to get in, but also the drugs to be kicked out. I mentioned before already that when metastatic disease is present, we think that there's always micrometastases, and I think they also need to be treated. Um, but this treatment needs to be according to the molecular profile, the histology of the tumor we treat. There is not one fits it all as we do. There is no more lung cancer or non-small cell lung cancer. There are specific subtypes. And as we go from year to year, we understand better uh, the subtypes. And we need treatments that are actually crossing the blood-brain barrier and getting there and therefore being effective, ultimately uh, can be effective. Now, some of the most effective treatments we have are monoclonal antibodies, but they actually will not cross the blood-brain barrier. So let me give you a couple of examples from the literature. And they're randomly taken. I, you know, I could go for two hours with many, many more examples what has been done. So carboplatin uh, paclitaxel is standard of care at many places or was for uh, treatment, uh, primary treatment of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So my colleagues in France added to this also bevacizumab. Uh, which is a monoclonal antibody, and used that regimen. That is a regimen that was uh, even formally approved uh, in the uh, 2008 to uh, around that time. What I want to show you here is just you see the responses. All patients are responding in the primary tumor, visceral, and also in the brain meds. I think there has been hardly any patient who would actually not respond everybody everywhere else, but not in the brain. So if you have the right treatment in the right intensity for the right patient, you get um, a response. Now, this trial was done in asymptomatic, in untreated brain metastasis. Now, you think, oh, but who would treat asymptomatic, untreated? Actually, we do treat more and more of those patients because those patients are identified as we do screening before starting to treat. So we will find way more brain metastases and would identify them, which we would not have identified before. So that's to be kept in mind. When you look at the survival, it's kind of what you usually would get. Um, seven months progression-free survival, 13 months overall survival with this kind of regimen. Did I do? Now, we have those targeted treatments. Um, Alectinib is a second-generation ALK inhibitor. Uh, you see the effort it takes to do such a trial. 1,300 patients were screened to then have 300 patients um, included. And the trial was done to look at comparison of Alectinib versus Crizotinib. And the difference on a chemical level is that electinib has a better uh, brain penetration and therefore should be uh, better in tr also treating the brain. And indeed, this is confirmed. What you can see is that the cumulative incidence of CNS metastases, um, and it's at one year, about 40% with of the chrysotinib patients, while it is only 10% of the lectinib, showing the right agent, yes, will treat the brain metastases that were there. All these patients had a brain MRI before inclusion, 
Um, so we didn't have rain mats at the time. So it can have an effect on that microscopic metastatic disease. Similar story here now, another one, brigatinib, also a second or third generation um, uh, ALK inhibitor. What you see is responses in the brain and outside the brain. And the, the, the way it is given, it has a run-in dose usually for of a 90 and then 180 milligrams is the standard. And you see patients who have it in the brain, they have all responded and they have all responded here. The res formal response rates are a little lower because about in uh, resist criteria, we ask for 30% response, but nothing is growing. So again, these patients did not get radiation. And there was no difference there. And the, and the overall survival was kind of what you would expect. And look at what is important here. You have a median survival of two years. And you, uh, so here, late effect, toxicity, cognition, radi reduced cognition after whole brain radiation and so on um, is important. Lastly, still in lung cancer, the FLOWER trial, osinomertinib, also a second or third generation EGFR inhibitor. Um, clearly, in patients with CNS meds, just as much as in non, uh, no CNS meds, improved progression-free survival and ultimately survival with uh, osimertinib. And these patients had brain metastases at the time they were included in the trial and randomized within the trial. I'll switch briefly switch gears on melanoma. Here we have BRAF, uh, positive melanoma treated with BRAF and MEK inhibitors combination. Look at this. No surgery, no prior treatment they had, uh, brain metastases. Almost all patients, all but two, responded. So clearly, you can forego radiation. You could even forego surgery, and you can treat them systemically, or at least systemically first. And then on patients who do particularly well, still consider where you want to do something else at the later stage uh, to consolidate. And with long survival, you can be detrimental with what we do. The brain as an immune privilege site, I mentioned that before, so I'm going to jump it, but it's important with, and again, I'll take the example of melanoma and of uh, non-small cell lung cancer here, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, immunotherapy here with pembrolizumab, you see responses also in the brain and the ones who would not respond, you can still irradiate them. And then you have some patients who have prolonged treatment, prolonged benefit. What is important is that you, they don't get steroids at the same time, because of course you don't drive your car with one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake. So you need to get them off the steroids as quick as possible, uh, and there are ways to do that. It's the same group has shown it here for non-small cell lung cancer, here for melanoma, that you have when they respond, they respond in the brain just as well as in the visceral metastases. In red is the visceral metastases. So either they do respond or they don't respond, but there is no difference in response or no obvious difference in response between brain metastases and absence of brain metastases. So you need to know your drugs. You need to know which do not cross, like taxanes, like monoclonal antibodies like Vincas, and we have the drugs that do cross the platinums, methotrexate, we heard for the lymphoma, 
um, Irena TCAN, Topo TCAN, uh, VP16, and many TKIs, but not all TKIs to the same extent as I've shown you with the different uh, studies uh, of crizotinib versus brigatinib or lectinib. So what I tried to show you, histologies of metastasis are not created equal. I tried to show you about a few data on whole brain radiation without going only too much into radiation. That would be a complete separate topic, but just not because it's said in the guidelines you need to radiate and it has been done for historical reasons. It's still true. And many trials really do not meet the standard criteria we would have today when you don't even have a baseline MRI, when you don't know what histology it is. The histology has not been reviewed. The tumors have not been characterized, and it's highly underpowered. The prognosis of patients with brain meds varies highly, but it can mirror systemic disease. Drug therapy is if, if you use the right drugs, effective in the brain, or if you want to say it's ineffective, it's just as ineffective as in the rest of the body. But it doesn't make sense to treat only the brain. And lastly, brain metastases are not the diagnosis. So really, the molecular makeup is important. You need to look at performance status, weight loss, but we need to exclude the patients from aggressive treatments who only have three months of life ahead of time. And we need to identify the molecular particular tumors with a longer natural history who will survive for 18, 24, or 36 and more months. I only mentioned, didn't show you data to uh, restrict the use of anti-epileptics and corticosteroids. And I think we will learn more. We will learn how to open the blood-brain barrier and we will develop more agents that particularly can be effective in the brain. With this, I conclude and I thank you for your attention.